We are in the midst of a series called God's Family Values. And as we were, were kind of processing through this, and I knew I was going to be up here teaching, I was looking through, I was like, you know what, I think a good topic to hit would be grace. And the reason we're talking about grace is because it's one of the most important, fundamental, I would say, values that we as Christians can embrace because grace is one of the, one of the foundational qualities of the God that we know and serve. And it's kind of like, you ever been to the eye doctor and there's the big E on the eye chart? It's like, if you can't see the E, you're not going to see the other ones. And, and grace is like one of those foundational values. Like, if we don't get this one, none of the other ones are going to make any sense and they're going to be kind of twisted and contorted if they're not filtered through uh, an understanding and, and a posture of grace. And the reason it's foundational is because grace is truly the foundation of our relationship with God. With God. You see this, for example, in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of work, so that no one may boast. Now, the challenge for us is that grace is this kind of alien thing. Grace is this alien and foreign thing to us. It's not the way that our world works. We are far more accustomed to the notion that you get what you deserve. That you get what you deserve. So, for example, if if you've had conversations with somebody on the subject of grace, and you talk about something like karma and then something like grace, karma tends to make much more sense to people. I get out of it what I put in. Grace is the exact opposite. Grace is we get what we don't deserve. And in fact, we are blessed when we deserve cursing. And the world functions and operates, and here's the catch, our own hearts tend to function and operate under this idea of karma. We get what we deserve, not grace. And because of this, we all have a tendency to drift away from grace as an anchoring value in our lives. Um, who here has plans to go to the beach this weekend? Anybody? Nobody. Wow. Rain. Oh, come on. What's, rain's going to keep you away from the beach? All right, well, let's try it this way. Who here has been to the beach before? All right, there we go. We're in Florida, so I'd hope we might hit, hit, hit a mark there. So when I was in high school, a group of my friends and I, we went to this beach called Phipps Park, and it's in Lake Worth, kind of West Palm Beach area. And Phipps Park is, is kind of a unique beach because out past the shoreline, the old A1A had been kind of sunk and formed uh, a man-made reef, if you will. And so the day we went there, the seas were rough. And so out past the, 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 the reef, if you want to call it that, right, there was like a six-foot break coming in. And so my buddy and I were looking at that, and we're like, this is probably a bad idea, but do you want to go out there and go body surfing? And as teenagers who think you're, you know, invincible, we say, yeah, let's go do this. Now, Phipps Park had, had a channel of maybe about 10 to 15 foot where you could get out through these rocks and then get out, get out into where the break was. So we go walking out, we go through the channel, we get out in the water, and we're out there body surfing for about an hour. The thing that we didn't, we didn't plan on is how the tide will do what? It'll carry you. So we're out there having a good time, and then we look up and we realize oh, hey, that channel we came out in is no longer in front of us. We've been adrift for the past hour, and so guess what we had to do in order to get back into shore? We had to go over the rocks. And six-foot shore break on rocks is not fun. Have you ever had that experience? It's terrifying. It's terrifying. And so just like if we don't stay grounded in grace, we will drift away from it and get tossed, spiritually speaking, upon the rocks. Make sense? And we end up inadvertently harming ourselves, and others. So this morning, what we're going to do is we're going to be walking through a very well-known parable of Jesus that I think um, really helps us zero in on the nature of grace and helps us understand what is the foundational bedrock upon which we are to relate to God and what is the foundational bedrock upon which we are relate to one another. And, and so my hope is that by looking at this parable together that we're going to accomplish you know, two main things. So first, for those of us who, are, who, would, who, who would profess that we are disciples of Jesus, that we're seeking to, to know him, to live in him, and to follow him, and to, and to pattern our lives after him, my hope is that, that by looking at this uh, parable, we're going to recalibrate our hearts. We're going to kind of set our compass to true north, and, and we're going to be rooted and grounded in God's grace, and it's going to help us to stay, you know, oriented in the right direction, so to speak, in life. For others of us in here, maybe you're here kicking the tires on Christianity, you're, you're curious, you're skeptic, maybe somebody tricked you into coming here, they, they offered you lunch or breakfast this morning, they pulled in the parking lot, and you're like, what is this? You're just like, ah. My hope is that as we walk through this parable, that, that the radical nature of God's grace would grip your heart, 
and that you would see who God is and that you would get a clearer picture for who Christ is and who Jesus is and, and, and ultimately who we, and, and, and bear, bear in mind, we as his disciples always fall short. And that's the point of grace. But nevertheless, Jesus is full of mercy and grace. And my hope is that that would grip not just your hearts, but all of our hearts this morning. Now, before we begin, uh, we'll kind of give you a heads up on the process here because it's a little bit different than maybe how we've gone through texts before together. So what we're going to do is we're going to kind of walk through the whole parable together. And the reason we're going to do this is because I want you to see how it ends. And I want you to understand that there's kind of a twist in this parable that Jesus um, kind of brings into it that his original audience would hear but we're not so keen to catch. So we're going to walk through the whole thing so we can see that twist and catch that, that ending, surprise ending that Jesus bakes into this parable. And then we're going to go back and we're going to kind of work through it in a little more detail to kind of highlight some of, some of the things that I think are really helpful for us this morning. Um, so you guys ready? I'm excited. Let me hear you. You got to at least lie to me. Lie to me. Like, yeah, I'm, uh, let's go, Charlie. All right? All right. Let's pray. Uh, Father, I ask your blessing upon us this morning. I pray that your spirit be at work in our hearts, Lord, that you would be exalted and glorified and that we would gain a clear picture of your grace. Lord, that you would orient our hearts to true north, which is grace, and that that would, uh, not only would it it guide us, but Lord, that it would fill us, that your grace would fill us. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we're going to be looking at the uh, parable that's in Luke 18. Verses 9 through 14. If you are using the Pew Bibles, um, I think it's on page 824. If somebody's on the Pew Bible, feel free to shout it out. And then, uh, so we're going to start with just verse 9. Verse 9 is kind of the setup, right? So in verse 9, we're told this. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. So a key thing here is righteousness, right? And so righteousness, if you think of it, it's a theological way of of talking about how one has good standing with God, right? So whenever the Bible uses righteousness with respect to a person and God's in the picture, it's kind of trying to convey how does one know one has good standing with God? If you are righteous, then you are welcomed into his presence. And if you are unrighteous, you are not welcomed into his presence. Make sense? Most of us kind of grasp that. God is holy. He's good. And how can... How can someone like me, for example, enter into a God who's holy or into the presence of someone who's holy? So there's two important things to notice in this kind of opening verse 9 setup for the parable. First is the people whom he's addressing, that he's going to address with this parable. We're told that they trusted in themselves as the basis of their relationship with God, right? They are off true north. They're adrift. They're like me at Phipps Park, drifting along the the, the shoreline, not even aware that they're crashing upon the rocks or going to be crashing upon the rocks. And more than that, we also see that they're treating others with contempt. So this word contempt basically means to to, to view others as if they're lesser of value or, or have no value. And so we see the two things playing out, for example, in their lives. They're trusting in themselves. And they're actually, in, in doing so, harming themselves ultimately, but also through their actions, they're harming others. They're harming others. So what follows now is the parable that Jesus tells to address these two issues, trusting in ourselves and treating others with contempt. So look with me at verse 10. It says, two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Now, it's important for us, and this is why I want us to kind of, we're going to pretty quickly after this, jump to the end so you can see the twist. Because what's important for us this morning is that we need to understand how these people were viewed in Jesus' day. It's inescapable that our culture has been shaped by biblical stories. So, for example, we hear this, and, and right when we hear Pharisee, we go, I can't stand people like that. How many of you, if you hear the word Pharisee, there's a, there's a visceral gut reaction to that word, and you immediately associate that with someone who's judgmental, hypocritical, bad, right? Raise your hands. You're feeling me on that one, right? The reason you have that feeling, that default response to that word Pharisee is because you, whether you know it or not, have been shaped by the stories that we have in Scripture. But now here's the catch. That wasn't the case for the original hearers. When Jesus told this parable, the Pharisees were not viewed that way. Pharisees were viewed with admiration and respect. They were religious and political and community leaders. They were admired, 
And to be called a Pharisee was to have been given a title of honor and dignity. It is not, or rather, it was not the negative label that we associate it with today. Make sense? Now, tax collectors, on the other hand, were viewed with disdain and disgust. Now, there's a certain continuity here. Who here likes paying taxes? Right? Nobody. But tax collectors in particular in Jesus' day were a, were a particular, uh, particularly uh, viewed with disdain because these were Jews who worked for Rome, which was an oppressive occupying nation. And what they did is they kind of served as middlemen to collect taxes for Rome. And so guess how tax collectors made their money? Not only did they charge you the tax, they padded a little bit extra on there and they kept that for themselves. So do you think they were well liked? No, not at all. Now, what's interesting is, is while we don't necessarily have uh, a, a contemporary equivalent to tax collectors, what we do have, or rather, is what we did have, is a guy by the name of Martin Shkreli. Martin Shkreli. Anybody know the name? Nobody? We well, got his picture. We should have his picture here. Do you look familiar? He was in the news. I think it was around 2015-ish, maybe? I can't remember the exact date. Martin Shkreli was a... Uh, an investor, he had a company, and through the company he bought the rights to Daraprim, which was a drug used to treat illnesses, um, particularly uh, infections, in those who had HIV and AIDS. And so he bought the rights to this drug, and he raised the price from $13.50 a pill to $750 a pill. Now, not illegal, but clearly most of us are like, there's something ethically questionable about that. Now, the reason I say that Martin Shkreli serves as a great kind of connection for us to understand how the culture viewed tax collectors is because there was a, there was a uproar culturally when this news story broke. And regardless of divisions, culturally, politically, everyone in this country shared a mutual sense of disgust towards Martin Shkreli. It was all over the news media. It was all over social media. Everyone hated this man. If you were to be associated with him, it was guilt by association. And, and, and that disdain and, dis, and disgust towards Martin Shkreli was so complete that not only did we feel it, we felt justified in feeling it towards him. Do you remember that cultural moment where there was this unified sense of, I hate that guy and I feel good about hating him because it's right to hate him. And we can all agree that together we can hate this man. That's how they felt about tax collectors. That's how they felt about tax collectors. So at the opening of Jesus' parable, he picks two people at polar opposites of the social ladder. Pharisee was the good guy. The tax collector is the bad guy. And the expectation is that surely it's the good guy who's going to stand before God justified, righteous, and accepted. And then Jesus reverses that expectation. Look with me at verse 11 through 14. Here's the parable. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like the other men extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man, referencing the tax collector, went down to his house justified. It was the tax collector who was declared righteous in the sight of God, accepted in the sight of God rather than the other, which is the Pharisee, the good guy. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Now, while we miss this, this parable, the ending of this parable, would have been um, disorienting for his original hearers, probably even offensive, probably even offensive. And so imagine, for example, that the person that you admire person that you esteem, the person that you desire and want to be like because you think they are amazing, right? This is the one who is rejected. And imagine the person that you despise, the person that you 
disdain, this person that you have contempt for. Imagine a Martin Shkreli being the one who is declared to be just and righteous in God's sight. Jesus is radically challenging our notions and assumptions about who and how one has good standing or righteousness with God. You see, the fundamental assumption of humanity is that it is the good people that have good standing with God. That was true then, and it's true now. The names and places, you know, have changed. It's not the Pharisees any longer, but it's somebody else. But nevertheless, the default assumption, the default way our heart leans is in the belief that it is the good who have good standing with God. And this parable of Jesus absolutely demolishes that idea altogether. In telling this parable, Jesus is uprooting that very notion, and he's communicating to us that it's grace, that it's the grace of God that makes, um, or rather, that is the basis of our standing and ongoing relationship with God. With God, And grace really tends to offend our worldly sensibilities because at some level, even when we understand grace and we've, we've walked with God, there's still parts of us that default to you get what you deserve. You get what you deserve. So now we're going to go back and we're going to look at some of the things that Jesus says and kind of draw out some implications for us this morning that are, that are really, I think, important for helping us kind of truly get a picture for what grace is and, and the kind of life that God would call us to walk with him in terms of our relationship with him and as well as our relationship to others in grace. So look with me back at verse 11 and 12. We're going to look at the Pharisee. So the Pharisee, he's standing by himself, Pray thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give tithes of all that I get. So here's what we need to understand, and I've already talked about this. They, they, they were viewed with esteem, right? Tax collectors were the good guy. He's the good guy. He's, he's, he's not really claiming perfection for himself here, is he? He's not. What's he saying? Hey, I've never killed anybody. I've never hurt anybody on purpose. I seek to be honest and faithful. I'm a good neighbor. I'm a good churchman. I show up for worship, and I tithe on everything that I give. And above and beyond that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm always using the spiritual disciplines, and I'm fasting to, 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 to draw closer to God through my life. He's saying things about himself that many of us would think about ourselves if we're honest. And he goes like this. Look, I know I'm not perfect. I know I'm not perfect but I'm not that bad. I'm not that bad. And the kicker is, the Pharisee, he's the guy you'd want for your neighbor. Right? He's going to hold down a job. He's going to take care of his family. He's going to pay the bills. The lawn's going to be mowed. He's not going to bring down your property values. He's probably going to come over and help you out if you're ever in need. He's the likable guy. He's the good guy. Not perfect, but not that bad either. Let's look at the tax collector, verse 13. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. This guy is a traitor and a thief. No bones about it. That's who he is. That's what he did. He was a traitor and a thief. And the thing is, even he knows it. Look at him. He's clearly ashamed of himself. He can't even lift his eyes to heaven. He's punching himself in the chest, and he's crying out to God. And there's no escaping the reality of this man's guilt and, and the fact that even he knows he's guilty because what does he do? He cries out for mercy and refers to himself as what? A sinner. As a sinner. There's no pretense here. There's no trying to pretend he isn't what he is. He's a crook. He's a thief. He's an oppressor. And when he comes before God, he acknowledges that and cries out for mercy. Verse 14, and Jesus says, it's this guy, the tax collector, is the one who goes home justified. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. So how is the worst one, how is the bad guy in this story, the one who is declared just or righteous or to have good standing before God and not the other, who everyone would have assumed is the good guy? And the answer is grace through faith in God as the one who justifies sinners. And so we're going to look at a comparison of the two to kind of draw this point home. So look at their point of reference. Look at their point of reference. 
What's the Pharisee's starting point in, in, return, in terms of his point of reference? He compares himself to other men and trusts in himself. Right? He even says, thank you that I'm not like this tax collector. Now, here, here's the truth. Um, you can always find someone that you think is worse than you. You ever done this? You ever played that game? So here, here's, here's a story from my own life. Um, and I may have shared this before, but if, um, if I have, bear with me. So when I was a teenager, my and my friend's life, lives could have literally been an HBO special. We were a train wreck. If there was a camera crew that followed us around and they put it on the TV, adults everywhere would have been in an uproar saying, the youth of today is falling off a cliff. Oh, my God, we got to fix things because we were horrible. Drugs, theft, all kinds of stuff in my life. And I kid you not, and I'm not making this up, numerous times I would be hanging out with my friends and we would have this very conversation. Yeah, we're not perfect. Yeah, we do a lot of dumb stuff. Da, 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 but at least we're not like so-and-so. How crazy is that? How crazy is that? So if you start with you in reference to somebody else for your determination of who's good, let's say, you can always find someone who you think is worse than you. It's an easy game to play. But the tax collector doesn't do this, does he? He starts rather with God as the point of reference for defining what is good. And in light of God and in who he is, he recognizes that he isn't good, and he throws himself upon God for his mercy and grace. You see, if you start with God rather than yourself and other people, then it's really hard to play the I'm awesome game. Make sense? Like if you thought you were good with, like if you played me in a game of basketball right now, you might think you're a great player because I'm going to miss shots, I'm going to get winded. It's not going to go well for me. And if you're like, man, I've got a shot at the NBA, you would be sorely mistaken because I'm not the, bar the barometer for what it takes to make the NBA. Now, if you were to play against somebody like Sha uh, Shaquille O'Neal, even though he's retired, it's probably not going to go well for you, right? So where you start matters. And if we start with God, then we end up in a different, with a different assessment of ourselves. Look at their prayers. What does the Pharisee highlight? He highlights his good deeds. He points to things like his giving and his faithful church attendance. What does the Pharisee do? He highlights his great need. Lord, have mercy upon me, a sinner. You see, the problem that Jesus is highlighting with this parable is that there are no good men who deserve God's grace. There are no good women who deserve God's grace. There are only sinners in desperate need of God's mercy and grace. And that's either to you going to be exceptionally good news this morning, or it's going to grate against your pride. It's either good news, or it's grinding on you. And some of us in here, and this is the way we do this, yeah, you don't know me, I, I'm not like the tax collector, I'm not like the Pharisee, you know, I'm not, I, look, I'm not perfect, I'll admit that, but I'm not that bad, you know. So let's play a game. This is a fun game. It inquires audience, right? Congregational participation. Um, uh, to this date, no one has won this game, but it's fun. We're going we're gonna to play it together, and it's called the Ten Commandments game. And I'm going to go easy on you. We're not even going to do all ten. We're just going to do five. Five of the Ten Commandments, okay? So, Ten Commandments, the, the, if, you, if you really think of the Ten Commandments, it's essentially the, the bare minimum of what it means to be a human being. That's what we're talking about here. The bare minimum of what it means to you be human. All right, you guys, I'm excited about this. It's fun. It's a fun game. I promise. All right. Not in any particular order. We're just going to work through five. How many of you have heard that one of the commandments is you shall not bear false witness? You shall not lie. Raise your hands if you heard that one. Okay. How many of you in here have, have ever told a lie? If, if you've said a lie, raise your hand. Right? Now, I know, I know. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. I know some of you, you had good intentions. You weren't lying because you were, you were actually, it was a white lie. You, you only lied because you wanted to help somebody or, you know, you want to hurt their feelings. But that counts too, so raise your hands. Okay. And if you're not raising your hand, you're a liar. <laughs> I'll just throw that out there. Okay. All right, so we're 0 for 1. Oh, you put your hands down, 0 for 1 at this point. Fun game, isn't it? We're having a good time. So we're all liars, room full of liars, right? 
All right, how, okay, next one. How many of you heard the commandment, basically, hey, if, if it's not yours, it doesn't belong to you, don't take it, don't steal. If you heard that one? Raise your hands if you heard that one. Okay? Put your hand, all right, now raise your mind. Anyone here ever taken something that wasn't yours? I know it was just the office pencil, and you justified it because it wasn't that expensive, and it's not that big of a deal, and you promised to return it at some point, but you never did, right? That counts too. Raise your hands. Come on. Room full of thieves. <laughs> so now we're 0 for 2. We've got three more. Now, mind you, there's 10. We're only doing five. So we're all in here at this point in time, 0 for 2. So we've got a room full of lying thieves. <laughs> Make sure you keep track of your wallets, people, because look who you're around. Lying thieves. All right, third one. God says, hey, don't covet. Don't covet. Don't look at what somebody else has with a spirit of envy and jealousy. Rather, if somebody has something, you should be joyful and you should celebrate what they have. How many of us in the room have ever looked at something that someone else got and thought, I should have that? That person's an idiot. Why did they get that raise? Why did they get that promotion? Why do they get the new car? How come they got the nice house? I should have those things. Anyone ever felt that way? Right. So, just to recap at this point, that's three. Three. And so far we have a room of lying, thieving, covetous people. Doing good here, right? Fun game, isn't it? Everyone, yeah? Some of you are like, oh my God, get me out of here. This is depressing. We only got two more. We only got two more, I promise. We're almost done. So, uh, God says, hey, um, don't commit adultery. If they're not your spouse... Don't sleep with them. And then Jesus says, hey, let me tell you something. If you look at someone and they're not your spouse and you look at them with lust in your heart, that is the same thing as committing adultery. So how many of us in here have ever looked at someone, a man or a woman, and had lust in our hearts when that person was not our spouse? Don't lie again. Come on now. I know this afflicts all of us in here, right? So here we are. Four of five, we are a room full of lying, thieving, covetous adulterers. <laughs> Feeling good about ourselves right now, aren't we? Yeah, fun times. Now maybe we'll get to, maybe we'll, maybe we'll, maybe we'll win one here. All right, maybe we'll put one on the board. Okay. Um, and this is this is the one that everyone goes to. To ju- like, I, I've never killed anybody. I'm not that bad, right? So God says, hey, don't commit murder. Don't. Co-. But then Jesus comes along and says, hey, if you've ever held had harbored hatred in your heart towards someone, you've murdered them in your heart, and you're just as guilty of this command. Anyone in here, for whatever reason, maybe you were betrayed, uh, maybe they wore some perfume you didn't like, maybe they cut in front of you in the line, you know, in Walmart, that god-awful place. Do you ever have to shop at Walmart when it's busy? You know, somebody cuts in front of you, it's like you call down the fires of heaven on them, right? Maybe somebody cuts you off, and you told them you're number one driving the car, right? Have you, ever, have you ever felt hatred, hatred towards another person, another image bearer? Oh, my goodness. All right, so we have a room full of lying, thieving, covetous, adulterous murderers. That's a fun game, isn't it, right? You're like, good times, good times. But here, here's, here's the kicker, right? When we stand before God and God judges us just on the basis of his Ten Commandments, this is where the line falls. This is where the line falls. There are no good men and women deserving of God's grace and mercy and embrace. There are Rooms full of lying, thieving, covetous, adulterous, murderers who envy and backbite and are full of jealousy and pride, who are in desperate need of God's grace. You see, the tax collector knew that he wasn't the good guy, and so he calls out for grace. Our issue, our issue, and this is the perennial issue for for mankind is that we are more prone to thinking like the Pharisee than we are the tax collector. We are more prone to thinking like the Pharisee than the tax collector. There's a guy named John Gerstner, and he wrote this uh, quote, and he says, the main thing, the main thing between you and God is not so much your sins, 
It's your damnable good works. And he's not saying don't do good works. He's not saying don't do good things. He's saying if you think your good works and those good things are the thing that mediate a good relationship between you and God, you are lost. The thing that mediates between us and God and establishes us in, in, a, in a place of, let's say, security and confidence in God's presence where we are declared to be righteous and just in his sight is his son, Jesus Christ, who lived, died, and rose again on our behalf. And it's through faith in Jesus as the one who saves and justifies sinners like you and me, that is the basis of our sure standing. Not what we do, past, present, or future, but what Jesus Christ has accomplished for us and continues to accomplish for us as he intercedes for us sitting at the right hand of the Father. Not your good deeds, not your good works, but Jesus and his one glorious good work on our behalf. So in closing, where are you at this morning? Where are you at this morning? Maybe you're dialed in. Maybe you get grace. Maybe you understand it and, and you resonate with this and you're like, man, thank you for saying this. It's a good reminder for me. Thank you for helping me to, to, to recall to mind the grace that God has shown me. And I would say, praise God if that's you this morning. But I'd also encourage you to stay, stay vigilant because our hearts are prone to drift away from the truth of God's grace. Now, if you sense this morning, maybe I'm adrift. Maybe, maybe you've got more in common with the Pharisee than you'd like to maybe admit. Maybe you're not giving voice to those thoughts and those feelings, but you clearly recognize that those thoughts and those feelings are present in your heart and your mind. That you do tend to have a pattern of looking at others who you think are worse than you and using their life and choices and actions as a means to justify yourself in your sight so that you can feel better about yourself. And if that's you this morning, in a few moments, I would encourage you to take some time to maybe dial back in to the grace of God. Maybe, however, you don't resonate with the Pharisee. You more resonate with the tax collector. You're here this morning, and you're keenly aware of your sin. You feel the weight of, let's say, guilt and shame for things that you've thought, things that you've done. And, and you feel this pressure weighing on you. And so if you're, if you're resonating with the Pharisee or the tax collector, hey, guess what? I've got phenomenal news for you this morning. In Matthew 11, 28 and 30, Jesus says this. He says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So if you feel the tension of recognizing your own thoughts are more patterned after the Pharisees, or if you feel the weight and pressure of guilt and shame because of your sin, then I would direct you to the grace of God that is found in, in Christ, that there is an inexhaustible well of love that pours forth from the Father, and that any who would simply, like the tax collector, throw themselves upon the mercy of God and cry out, have mercy on me, a sinner, will be redeemed, restored, embraced, and, and, and adopted as God's sons and daughters. In God's family, grace is a foundational value. It is the bedrock of our relationship with God, and it should be the bedrock of our relationship with others. The, the grace that is shown to us would fill us, and through us would be poured out among others who are around us. Our, our co-workers, our neighbors, the person that cuts in front of you at the line at Walmart, that we would ooze grace, that we would emanate grace. Why? Because we have been shown so much grace ourselves. Grace is the big E on the I chart. It is a foundational value. And if we don't get this one, we won't get any of the other ones. Will you pray with me? Father, we come before you this morning as a room full of people acknowledging our need and sin before you. Lord, may you pour out your spirit upon us. Lord, if we resonate in any way with the Pharisee or the tax collector, I pray that our hearts would turn to you, we would cry out for mercy, and Lord, that your spirit would pour out grace upon grace. Lord, that we would be immersed in your love and that we would know your, your acceptance of us, your approval of us, and your embrace of us, not because of who we are, but because of who you are. 
because of your goodness and your grace. Now, Lord, may we rejoice in your presence, and may we give thanks to you for your mercy and for your love. And it's in Jesus' great name we pray. Amen.